I would have to say it was the opposite of natural and that I had many other, actually I think really wor more worthy ambitions, um, becoming Marie Curie, becoming a vet, um, becoming a chemist, um, you know, I was much more interested in some ways in science as a teenager. Um, and in my 20s, I, grad I mean, I mostly thought about you know, that it would be good to work for, say, an organization like Amnesty or Oxfam, you know, that, um, that that was the best use of my talents. But for some reason, that's not the path I chose. Um, but my parents um, were appalled, I think, at my interest in writing, and they both died before they could see that interest come to fruition. Um, I did... Um, I mean, I, I lived with someone in my 20s who, although he was, he was a philosopher, he read passionately and, you know, loved novels and fiction. So that was an encouragement. And um, after I had published a few stories, I went to the Breadloaf Writers Conference in Vermont. And, you know, I discovered there were these people, American writers, and some of them were lovely. And so I started getting to know my fellow writers. Um, I have had, you know, generous grants from the NEA and the Guggenheim Foundation, for which I'm hugely grateful. Um, and, and my fellow writers, I would say that there's a core group of people on whom I count absolutely. Um, um, my, my dearest friend, writer Andrea Barrett, I ex wonderful writer, I exchange all my work with her. So probably anything longer than a postcard that I write, Andrea will have writ read. Well, the essays and reviews are written, you know, they nearly always have a clear objective, a clear destination. They're written for a newspaper or a magazine or a publication. So they have a slightly different feeling than the fiction. The fiction Nobody, I mean, I don't think that anybody really cares whether I write fiction. And I don't think the world needs more books, although it certainly needs better books. Um, the fiction I do anyway. Um, I happen to be published at the moment, but I would probably continue even if I was not published. Mm -hmm. I, having written... Um, a really, really terrible novel that was not published, but on which I spent a lot of time. I, my ideas for my novels are rather relentlessly auditioned, and I have to feel fairly confident that I could explain to someone else why they would be interested. Um, in the case of Eva Moves the Furniture, I mean, a novel which took me 12 years to write, um, I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks was that I that it was based very loosely on the life of my mother, and I just presumed that, that people would be interested in my mother. But when I stopped to think, that was really daft. I mean, everybody has a mother. Why, why should anyone stop to be interested in mine rather than their own? So I really work very hard, and this may seem to contradict what I said earlier about readers, but I work very hard to try to find an intersection between my personal preoccupations and public concerns. I want to be able to say to people, you know, this, this is why I think you should be interested. Well, in the case of um, a novel, The Missing World, which revolves around a woman who loses part of her memory, it came partly from um, debates in newspapers and magazines about, on the one hand, the idea of buried memories or repressed memories surfacing. On the other hand, about the idea of the inaccuracy of memories and how memories could be shaped by different questions being asked. And on the third hand, by concerns with Alzheimer's and people with dementia and people losing their memories. So I thought of memory as a very as a fascinating public topic. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to write a novel that in, in some way meditated on those concerns while also having a very strong plot. 
Ideally, when I'm not being interviewed by you or going to meet my lovely students, I um, go to my desk first thing and I stay there till around noon or so, and then, um, and then the uh, affairs of the world usually start to interrupt. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but I do try to, like many novelists, I do try to write most days. I do meet my readers sometimes when I go to give readings or um, at library events or in, in various ways. Yes, I meet people who've read my work. Well, it's interesting to compare life in the States to two other countries I know somewhat well, Canada, where I spent much of my time in my 20s in Britain. In Canada, writers are extremely generously supported in a number of ways. And you know, many of the Canadian writers I know can actually sort of stay afloat without teaching. In the States, the primary supporter of writers is academia, much more than any grants or prizes. It's the universities and colleges that are keeping most writers afloat. In Britain, many writers work in journalism, television, radio, print media. Um, so you know these three these three different models. I, I you know I find I find it very interesting. Yes, and you can share them all because you know about what exists in these different cultures. Yes. I would say that um, although it may make you feel like a grown-up and although it may seem seductive because it makes you feel part of an intellectual community, teaching is a dreadful job for a young writer. It's poorly paid, it's incredibly demanding, there are no clear boundaries. Um, and if you want to do it in good faith and do it well, you can just pour an enormous amount of time into it. So, you know, learn, learn to mix drinks, learn to drive a bus, learn to milk goats, you know, I'd say almost anything is better than teaching. That said, almost all my students who have those kinds of jobs are desperate to get into teaching because it feels like being a grown-up, it feels like the imprimatur, and having spent my twenties as a waitress and working in dry cleaners and shops, I have some sympathy with that. It's a complicated question. I would say that I have met over the years quite a number of writers, mostly women, who have been in the position of being supported by a partner. And it has not invariably been the best thing for them in terms of their writing. Um, that said, um, I do think that, of course, you know, people need need money and privacy, um, but they also need to have, I think, some other things that are less easy to, to codify. They need um, to bring passion and focus and urgency to their work. Um, you need to have a, a certain level of ego to be a writer, I think, because really, why should anyone stop and listen to you? I mean, if you write fiction or poetry that, rather than a journal or letters, the presumption is it's public, and so you're saying, you know, stop and listen to me. And um, so I think there, are, I think, I think what people need is sometimes a little bit, a little bit complicated. Um, and um, I think if Virginia Woolf were alive now, she would rewrite the essay, perhaps to say two rooms of one's own, because I think most people need one room in which to write fiction and another room in which they keep their computer and interact with the electronic world. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, that's it.